To continue our conversation on seminary formation, we turn to Father Matthew Kauf. He's the rector of St. Joseph College Seminary in North Carolina. The seminary outside Charlotte is just six years old. Father Kauth, what was the inspiration in opening this new seminary on a college campus and especially starting a seminary when vocations seem to be declining? It's a good question. It's a, it was a foolhardy adventure, but it was marked with a number of different notes of providence, not least of which was I was returning back from Rome um, having worked on a doctorate in moral theology and had some opportunities to teach in offers to teach in seminaries at the time. And I I wanted to come home. And when I came home, I began to teach at Belmont Abbey College, which is you know, right here in our backyard as a diocese, an incredible resource. And so I began to talk with the, uh, the president of the college about different ways we could collaborate with the college since I was teaching there. And eventually, from different sources, including my own considerations, um, this idea of having a local seminary began to, to sort of take shape in my mind. But at the same time, we had been working on uh, kind of a culture of vocations for a long time in the diocese here, for about 10 to 15 solid years of really working on vocations, and we began to see some of the fruit of that. So in some ways, we wanted to not outsource our own fatherhood, but be able to take care of the men that were coming up through our parishes and those vocations that were, that were growing and rising, to take care of them here locally. To care for them yourselves. And then what does that day-to-day -day life look like for your seminarians? <laughs> I think you might get a different answer if you ask them. <laughs> um, it's it's highly regimented. I mean, the nature of formation is such that we consider the world to not be such a good formator. And so the first things that happen with men is almost a kind of detox, right? They, mm. they detach themselves from, from social media, they detach themselves from um, a sort of worldly pursuit. And they have awful uh, uh, amounts of discipline in the beginning, but it's what seems to them to be sort of almost constrictive discipline in terms of they get up except, exceptionally early. Most of them are in the chapel by about uh, 5.30, 5 mm. o'clock. Um, they have to be there by 6.00. Um, and then our day is, is, is very ordered at this stage of formation in terms of college formation, because it's you're working principally on human formation at this point, the development of a character. So self-knowledge and self-mastery, especially mm -hmm. over the passions and the various emotions in life and trying to form, as C.S. Lewis says, a, a strong chest. Um, and so discipline is part of that. And so getting up early, being in chapel on time, spending vast amounts of time uh, in both mental prayer and communal prayer. And then after that, the men would have in some ways a normal college sort of experience because they go to class. Mm. Um, the difference is they come back here, they go over to the Abbey for class for the most part. Some classes we teach here in-house. And they come back here and we have formation classes, but also um, things like chant and, and music and liturgical instruction, et cetera. Um, and then all sorts of uh, sort of in-house talks that we do on various topics of discernment and formation and, of course, more prayer time. But then at the end of the night, um, we basically go into grand silence and from 8 o'clock until 8 in the morning. So every weekday, we have 12 hours of, of silence to allow them to cultivate uh, their interior life, not just for their studies, um, so they're not distracted during uh, study time, but also to develop that quiet and silence with our Lord um, to be able to listen to him. Grand silence. I love that. You just had your first class graduate. What kind of success then has your seminary seen so far? Well, we've, we, we began in 2016 and we're into our seventh year now. And the first year we opened, we didn't know if we would have anyone join because we didn't really have a college program per se before that. We had one or two college guys that were in the program, but we weren't sure what would happen ultimately if we started. And so we had one house that had eight rooms available. It was an old convent and eight men joined. And so we were full. So the next mm. year we bought another house that was uh, contiguous and we had eight beds available and eight men joined. That same thing happened every single year. Every year we have, no matter what the numbers seem to be in the beginning, you always end up with eight. And so we have had, we've had 50 men come through here in the last, uh, wow. in the last uh, seven years. So just from our diocese. So we've been very blessed with a, a fine group of men, and not just quantity, but, but quite serious, uh, serious men and men that are, are, are lovers of our blessed Lord.
and that kind of formation stays with you forever, whether you continue or not. A recent study says that about half of priests ordained this year said that friends and family discouraged them from joining the priesthood. Why do you think this is the case, and, and what role does the family play then in vocations? I think people are afraid. I mean, and, and to some degree, rightly so. Um, they're concerned about the kind of life their son might live in, in a world that looks upon the priesthood with a fair amount of disdain and certainly an awful lot of suspicion. Um, they probably have examples of priests who are living a communal life or a fraternal life who are themselves um, lonely or becoming a bit, um, shall we say, um, skewed in their in their outlook because they don't have a normal prayerful communal life mm -hmm. or a church that supports that life. Um, one of the things we're trying to do here, because that's kind of the number one factor of, of priests either leaving or becoming dissatisfied, is trying to make sure we build very strong fraternal bonds among the men. Um, and thank God, because of the numbers that we have, there's nowhere they're going to go in the diocese that they wouldn't have that brother right next to them, right. you know, sort of at their side to make sure that they're being uh, held accountable, but also just for the joy of, of doing the ministerial stuff together as the first apostles did. Helping them stay together through building community. That same survey, though, says that many men think about the priesthood when they're as young as 16. How do you right. encourage young men then to consider the seminary knowing that they're going to have these other challenges? Right. So I think the most important thing is just the witness that they see amongst the men themselves. And so we have been fostering a retreat in the summer that's geared toward men of that age. And we have had consistently about 100 persons participate, 100 young men participate in that every single summer. Wow. But the most important thing is to have them have contact with our current seminarians. So imagine you have 100 young men that are encountering 50 uh, seminarians of that same age group. So whether it's 18 up to up to 30, but, you know, relatively close in age. And to see these men not just be um, lovers of prayer and of, of the sacraments, but also they're just normal. And they're good. They're 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 not off-putting. They're not awkward. Um, they're athletic. They're whatever. I mean, the, the normal kind of men. And watching these men grow, not only in virtue, just for these young, younger men to see that this is possible, but to watch their joy. And joy is simply infectious. Yes. If they see a well-ordered man that's joyful, most young men will look at that and say, "I don't know if I have a vocation, but I want what he has." Yes. So what does he have? Um, and so that's part of the. Um, part of that, I would say, the, the normal response that we get from young men, which isn't the same thing as a vocation, but it's a good start to get them to, to be open to the possibility. And open to the possibility of having a long-term relationship with Jesus Christ, whether they become a priest or not. Absolutely. Thank Absolutely. you so, so much, Father Kalp. You're welcome. Great to be with you. Great to be with you.